Okay, we are now dealing with chapter 30, which is looking at emission of light. Let's make this full screen. Okay, perfect. Okay, to look at emission of light from atoms, <coughs> we need to look first at the the Bohr model or the planetary model of the atom, right? So the BOHR model or the planetary model of the atom is where the nucleus is at the center, kind of like the sun in the solar system. And just like around the sun, we have the different planets, right? In this model, we have electrons in the first shell, the second shell, the third shell, and so forth. So this is a cross-section, a two-dimensional schematic of the model of the atom. A if you will, a three-dimensional schematic would look at the same thing except realize that instead of a circle, this is actually a sphere. So at the very center is the nucleus that has protons and neutrons. The first shell out has is a spherical shell that has electrons, up to two electrons in it. Then there's a gap. Then there is a second shell that has electrons in it. Then there's a gap. Then the third shell and so forth. All right? Moving on to the second slide. Introducing the concept of excitation. Excitation is like exciting something, right? In excitation, you are boosting one or more electrons in an atom. So here is a schematic showing the, the orbitals of an atom. The nucleus, the first shell, second shell, third shell. This blue thingamajiggy is an electron in the first shell. What you can do is you put energy into the into the atom and that kicks this electron up to the next shell. So the electron that's sitting here jumps up into the next shell. So now this electron has excess energy. This is just as if, don't do this experiment, but if one of you were to hop on top of this table, right? When you're on top of this table, what happens? You have gravitational potential energy. Your energy has become higher, right? So in that sense, you're like an excited electron, right? Now, when you jump down, when you jump down, what happens is that excess gravitational energy is given off. It's first of all the, the potential energy is converted into kinetic energy that accelerates you down, and then when you hit the floor, you hear a sound, right? And like if you were to jump onto a balloon or something, you can pop the balloon. You're doing work as a result. Similarly, what happens is this excited electron can then jump down, and when it jumps down, it gives off its energy in a photon. A photon is a particle of light. Cool? So if you were to climb on top of the table and jump off, what happens is the energy goes off in the sound that you hear, which is pressure waves traveling through the air. There are also pre vibrations, pressure waves that travel through the ground, right? So this would be the equivalent of you emitting a photon, except these are not photons, these would be like phonons. In the atom, as the electron jumps down, it can give off a photon or it can do other things to the atom in giving off its energy. But for the level of this lecture, we're dealing with just photons. Yes, mademoiselle? So if it gives off a photon, mm -hmm. and I'm just reading that because it says it, it decays, mm -hmm. does that mean that every time that happens, the, um, the electron becomes weaker or not as, because it's giving out energy? Mm -hmm. Okay, good question, extra credit to you. It's not that the electron becomes, it's kind of like if you were to climb on top of this table, right? To a first appro approximation, let's say you're not using up internal energy, mm -hmm. right? What happens is, energy comes from outside. I give you a, what's your chocolate, favorite chocolate? Three musketeers, I guess. Okay, I give you three musketeers, right? You get all excited. Mm -hmm. You eat them, three musketeers, extra energy, use up that energy and climb on top of the table. Okay. Now you jump down, that extra energy that came into you from the three musketeers has been used up. Okay. and is then translated into the sound energy and so okay. forth, right? So the electron itself is not changed. Okay. If the electron is changed in some fact, I mean, to the extent of our understanding, the electron is not changed by any of these processes, just its state is changed. Okay. If you ever find, if you can find that the electron is changed in some fundamental fashion through these processes, it's guaranteed Nobel Prize. So you, you are welcome to do, set up the experiments this weekend, get a Nobel Prize and get an automatic A in this class. So. They never, are they like, okay, because we talked about atoms and they just exist forever, like they don't, you can't mm -hmm. do anything to them, like they just, they don't die, they don't. Hmm. Okay, excellent question, extra credit again, right? 
<laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> it is like racking up. Okay. So, uh, for the level of this course, conceptual physics, that's true, that items don't die. Okay. In real life, they do die over time in different ways. In other words, the, here's the things that can atom, like the atom is a nucleus and then the electrons around it, right? You put enough energy into the electrons, the electrons can escape, right? And the atom, as all the electrons leave, it becomes like an empty nester. All the kids are gone, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So it's just like the positively charged core. Now, the positively charged core itself, which is protons and neutrons, over extended periods of time, it can turn out that other particles can come and hit the nucleus and break it apart, right? Depending on the energy incoming. Even separately from this, what happens is protons and neutrons can undergo decay processes. And so, like a proton can decay into a neutron, a neutron can decay into a proton, things like that, over very, very long time frames, and, and so forth. So we don't know if these particles would last indefinitely, right? It's just that there can be processes that destroy them over very, very long time frames, time frames that are much longer than we are able to observe, right? Good questions. So what happens is this atom is in an excited state because the electron is excited. It's at a higher energy level. So this decays or de-excites and this electron jumps down. When it jumps down, it emits this photon. The energy of the photon is proportional to its frequency. So here's the, notice that this is a red photon. If you were jumping instead of from here to here, this is a smaller energy than from here to here, right? jumping from a higher shell down here is the equivalent of if this table were twice its height and you jump down. So there's more energy that's given off, right, when you jump from a higher table. So similarly, if, if a photon jumps from here to here, instead of giving off a red photon, rather if an electron were to jump from here to here, it could give off a blue photon, which is higher energy than the red photon. Cool? So from here to here, smaller energy, red photon. From here to here, larger energy, blue photon higher energy photon. So the energy E of the photon is a constant, Planck's constant, H. Don't ask me why it's H rather than P for Planck. Multiply by F for frequency. So this energy difference between the shells determines the energy of the photon. E, now H is a constant. Divide one by this by that. And this by this gives you the frequency of the photon. So that determines the color of the photon because the color of the photon is basically a measure of, it. I mean, the frequency maps to the color. So it's just like when at night, if you mm -hmm. have something and you'll see like light, like shocks, like if you have like a mm -hmm. fleece blanket or something, you know how it carries a lot of static. Okay. And you kind of go like that and then you'll, or you, I don't know, mm. if you take a diaper and you pull the thing off, you'll see like light if it's really dark. Really? Wow. So Extra would credit this be you. an example of they're excited and then they're, it's the photons that are Yeah, it could be that the, the, the diaper is like all excited about being free now. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> Finally, I'm free. Yeah. Yes. Um, okay. So I'm just trying to apply where this would actually Good happen, point. Like. What is happening in that case, like the sparks that you see at night, is basically like um, it's static electricity. Okay. Where so electrons separate. are actually moving from one place. Like when you peel off this, the tag from the diaper or whatever, what happens is some electrons go with this tag that should have been there. So this becomes negative, positively charged, that's negatively charged. Then at some stage, the negative charged electrons leap across to this. It's like a bolt of lightning. That's what you see as the... Okay. The spark, right? So where, what's an example of that happening? I'm trying to apply it. Like. Okay. The situation that you're talking of, what happens is the outermost electron gets energy when you rip it apart. Oh, yeah, no, I And that, it gets, so the process that you described, you're creating a hole in the outermost electron. Those electrons then go off and create lightning, right? They create lightning. Now, an example of this will be coming up in a future slide, oh, okay. right? Oh, but a good segue, that's perfect, that's great. Extra credit. So if, if we don't see an example of that, remind me, right? And we'll talk about it. Okay, so introducing a spectroscope. A spectrum is basically the range of electromagnetic radiation, various frequencies of radiation. Spectroscope is an instrument that you use to look at the range of electromagnetic radiation. So this is an example of a spectroscope that's set up for an emission spectrum. Spectrum is the range of radiation, different frequencies. Emission is where the atoms are emitting, giving out the light. This is different from absorption, right? 
So emission is kind of like if you were to fling thousand dollar bills in my direction. So you're emitting thousand dollar bills, right? So, so you are emitting, that's emission. The frequency, if you will, of the bills is a thousand. So if you were to fling thousand dollar bills and hundred dollar bills and five hundred dollar bills, here are three frequencies, thousand, five hundred, hundred, right? So you're emitting at those different frequencies and that is the emission spectrum. Now absorption is different. Let's say that I were flinging out thousand dollar bills and you absorb them. So none of them get through to the other students, poor things, right? And you get like totally rich. So, and I become totally like poor, right? So, yes, good point. So that would be an absorption spectrum. You're, you're absorbing. Let's say that I'm flinging thousand dollar bills for five hundred dollar bills, hundred dollar bills, and you say hundred dollar bills are beneath my dignity to pick up. However, I'll pick up the thousand dollar bills and the five hundred dollar bills. So your absorption spectrum is a thousand and five hundred. The hundred, you let it go through the poor students behind you. I know, yes. Okay, so here's the source. It's basically like a material of some kind that you heat up a whole bunch that gives off light. The light from it goes to a converging lens that converges down to a point, focal point. Put a slit here. Now it diverges past the point to another converging lens which converts this into a near parallel beam of light which is sent through a prism. The prism takes this white light, if you will, and spreads the different colors so you end up with the different colors coming out right from the different parts of this prism coming onto a screen here to give you a red yellow violet colors for instance so what happens is these frequencies that were in this light that look white to you got split up into the different colors here now you could use a spectroscope to look at the light coming from your fluorescent light or from the projector and the same thing would happen that light would get spread out into these different colors right a absorption spectrum, what happens is you put uniform white light, let's say, sending it through this lens into a vapor. So in this case, sodium vapor. Take sodium, right, heat it up, becomes a vapor. And what happens is the vapor absorbs certain frequencies of light. And so the remaining, so it becomes white light minus those absorbed frequencies, gets goes through this lens, which is converged to a point, then diverges through this lens, sent to the prism, and gets separated out. So in this case, you see that there's red and violet, red and violet. So you can see the sodium vapor absorb what color? Yellow. yellow. Right? It absorbed yellow. Now, if you were to take sodium, sodium vapor, heat it up like there, it will give off yellow light. Kind of like the light that it absorbed, not the same light, but it gives off the same energy, right? levels of light. And this is why you've heard of sodium vapor lamps, street lights, right? So if you look at street lights, there are some areas where you have a, like a strong yellowish light and they're called sodium vapor lamps because it used to be that those light, those lamps actually had sodium vapor that was used like this to give off that yellow light. Okay, so emission spectrum, we said the range of frequencies that are emitted from the atoms. So distribution of wavelengths in the light from a luminous source. So you take a little blob of calcium, right? So like a little cube of calcium, you heat it up a whole bunch. What happens is it gives off light. You use a spectroscope to separate out the light into the different colors and you actually see these bands. So there's a frequency of light coming here. There's a gap with no light frequency here. So notice that these are kind of reddish. As you travel here, they start becoming yellowish. Over here, they become blue, heading towards violet, right? So this is like a signature for calcium. Now many of you have probably seen shows like CSI and so forth, right? The crime shows. And what happens is somebody gets killed and they find a piece of gravel or a little piece of sand or a lint or something on the person, right? In the person's body and they take it to a lab. What they'll do in a lab is they will go ahead and put it into a spectroscope like this. Where like you heat it up and it gives off light and it gives a certain signature. So let's say that you get this set of lines and this set of lines. So that tells you that that piece of whatever it was, material, has calcium and strontium in it. But it does not have barium, right? Barium or zinc or cadmium or mercury. So in the CSI like shows, what they do then is to say, aha, there's a particular quarry in a particular spot out in the boondock somewhere that has sand of exactly that composition. Therefore, this body probably was killed there. So they go there and look there and they find evidence of the whatever, the DNA of the person who did it, right? So this is like a fingerprint. So this is a fingerprint for calcium, fingerprint for strontium, and so forth, right? Now, the reason why we get all these different lines is when you excite the electrons up to higher 
levels in the bands. This electron can jump down from here, higher level to a lower level, give off blue light, like you see here. Jump from here to here, and if this frequency gap is smaller than here, it would give out kind of cyan light. So this blue would be higher energy, cyan would be lower energy. Then you can jump from here to here and give off like a lower energy light, like here, if this height is smaller, right? So, so what happens is, the bands to the right are bigger gaps, bigger jumps. The bands to the left are from smaller jumps. That's how you get the different colors that you see. Now, an electron, instead of jumping from step to step to step, can actually jump from here, skip the step, and jump all the way down here. So it's kind of like if you were on the table, don't do this, and there's your chair, you could step from the table down to the chair, then step from the chair down to the ground, right? So that would be the equivalent of this. From table to chair to ground. Or you could just jump directly off the table to the ground and, and avoid the chair. That would be like this. So in this case, you give off an even higher energy. So notice that the frequency is much higher here than these, right? Higher energy light coming out. That's how you end up with all these different colors of light, right? So the absorption spectrum is, again, if you send continuous white light into the material, what happens is the material absorbs light at this specific frequency, this, each of these black bands. So wherever it absorbs light, you end up with a black band in the resulting absorption spectrum. This maps to the emission spectrum. In the emission spectrum, it's totally black, and you, the, you heat up the material and it gives off light at this particular band, right? Each of these frequencies. So you can see the absorption is exactly the inverse or the converse. Of, this is the absorption spectrum, it's absorbing light. This is the emission spectrum, it's emitting light. Okay, incandescence is basically the state of glowing when you heat something. So you take something and you heat it up, and what happens is the electrons, the atoms get excited, there's more energy coming to them, they get excited, which means the electrons are kind of whizzing back and forth faster, if you will, as they vibrate, and that gives off light of different frequencies. That is incandescence, right? Now, if you look at the brightness of the light on the y-axis versus frequency along the x-axis, you will end up with the energy looking like this. Where if you, for instance, heat the material up, take a piece of iron, heat it up to 1000 degrees centigrade, you'll end up with brightness of light with its peak at a certain frequency. So 1000 degrees centigrade peak at a certain frequency. Heat this material up even further, what happens is you end up with the peak frequency shifting to a higher number. So 1500 C, it has peaked, the amount of light coming out has gone up and so has the frequency, peak frequency of the light. Now this is the reason why if you turn on your stove top, right, you will notice that initially when you look at the stove top it's totally dark and then gradually it starts heating up, it looks kind of a dull red, then as you get hotter and hotter it becomes more yellow, right? Now in print, and what's happening is literally as its temperature goes up, the light that's being emitted, the amount of light increases and also the peak shifts more towards the right. Right? That's why it's changing from dull red to orange to yellow, heading towards white. In principle, it could go blue, but it, it doesn't in, in real life. So the frequency here, the peak frequency, F bar here, is this tilde means proportional to T, the temperature. The higher you heat it, the greater the frequency, the average, rather the peak frequency of the light coming off. Introducing the concept of fluorescence. In the case of fluorescence, what happens is they absorb energy in one frequency, then re-emit the radiation at a lower frequency. So basically, so in the case of fluorescence, here's the atom, you put energy into the atom, and this kicks an electron from a certain level up to the next higher level. It jumps up to a higher level. Now, then what happens is that electron jumps down and gives off light. That light can be the same frequency as the incoming light or it can be a lower frequency, right? So this is fluorescence. Now in the case of fluorescence, this happens immediately. You hit the atom, it jumps, it jumps up, it immediately jumps down and gives off the light, right? Phosphorescence, which is different from fluorescence, is the same phenomenon but there's a time delay. In the case of phosphorescence, you may have heard of phosphorescent dye, right? In the case of phosphorescence, what happens is you kick you put energy into the atom, the atom jumps to the excited state, and it stays, it, like the electrons hang out in the higher state, decide let's have a tea party or whatever, right? Hang out there, have a beer, and sometime later they decide, okay, let's jump down. 
right? That's the lazy electrons. They jump down and give off their higher energy. So phosphorescence will last over a longer period of time. Have you ever noticed, you have a TV in your bedroom, you switch off all the lights, you look at the screen, what do you see with the TV off? Anybody see, notice anything? What? Kind of close. Yep. Has anyone else noticed that? Right, if, particularly if the room is really dark, switch, switch all the lights and the TV screen still glows. Even though, and let's say that you didn't have the TV on at all. TV was off with the lights on for a while. Now switch off the bedroom light, the screen glows. Now look at it again in about five minutes. What's happened to the screen? Over time the glow disappears, right? That residual glow is phosphorescence which is this phenomenon. Now this phenomenon where the incoming light right from your fluorescent lights and so on hits the TV screen it takes the atoms in the screen to higher energy here. Now in fluorescence those electrons jump down to a lower energy immediately. So you don't have any residual glow. If, if it's all fluorescence and no phosphorescence you put off the light and it's totally blank, dark. However if some of it is phosphorescence then the electrons continue to stay at the higher level and then gradually jump down one by one and they keep giving off light. Okay? Now, what happens is an example of fluorescence is the fluorescent lights, fluorescent lights that we have in our classroom. In this case, you've got the fluorescent tube, right? Glass tube with now current goes through this filament here, right? You apply a voltage and there's a bias between here and the, the filament on the other side and what happens is electrons come off of this heated filament and as they go into the phosphorescent rather the fluorescent tube there's mercury vapor right now I have no idea if the, these particular ones do this but this is how it used to be done there'd be mercury vapor in here the, elect the electron hits the mercury atom and causes it to get excited so it excites the mercury atom which then jumps down and gives off a ultraviolet photon the ultraviolet photon then goes and hits that white powder on the inside of the tube. If you ever, any of you ever broken a fluorescent tube, right? If you look at the inside, there's a white powder, right? Mm -hmm. You do not want to lick that powder. Do not lick the powder. Do not use it on cake or cookies. And so on. it looks like powdered sugar, right? So, sorry, that's the phosphor. So the white powder on the inside of these tubes is the phosphor. So what happens is the reason for the white powder is the mercury, if you didn't have that white powder, what would happen is the electrons come, kick the mercury up, mercury jumps down and gives up ultraviolet light. We can't see ultraviolet light, we just get sunburn or whatever from it, right? It doesn't light up a house. Now with the white powder, what happens is the ultraviolet photon puts energy into the white powder, gets those atoms to go up to higher energy, and then they jump down. And this time instead of giving ultraviolet light, they give our red, green, blue light. Different atoms give up red, green, blue that combines to give us white light. And that's the way you can tune the color of the fluorescent lights. You know that you can buy fluorescent lights with different colors, right? I mean like more sunlight looking more white, blue white. And you can do that by tuning the composition of the atoms in the white powder, right? So this is an example of the application that you asked about, right? Okay, so we talked about phosphorescence. Previous slides were fluorescence where the atom jumps up to the higher level, jumps down immediately and gives off light. In the case of phosphorescence, what happens is the same situation. The atom becomes excited, but it hangs out for a while at the excited state, and then some jump down. A little later, some more jump down. A little later, some more jump down. So the emission of the light is time delayed compared to the absorption of the, light, of the energy. That's phosphorescence. Okay. These three, do you notice that there's a difference in the waves between here and there? Right? All of these are one color and they're all totally in step. They're in phase, right? It's like soldiers marching in phase. This is light of the same frequency, but the light is not. So we know it's the same frequency because they're all the same color. They say have the same wavelength, but they're not in phase, right? Like one has got a peak when the other's got a trough and so on. In this case, what happens is you have different colors. So we've got different wavelengths and they're not in phase. So normal white light is incoherent and it's white. Incoherent, it's white because it's all these different colors and it's incoherent because they're not in phase. The next step is to make it single frequency. Instead of white light, it's all freak single frequency like, like a red bulb. But there are different phases. They're not all acting together. Now, if you get the light waves to all line up like this so that they're all one color and they're all in phase, this is called coherent light 
and that's what you get from a good laser. A good laser will have all of the wavelengths of one, all of the the waves coming out with one fre frequency. They all have the same frequency, and they all are in phase. They're jumping up and down together, right? This kind of light is very powerful and can be used to burn hole in, holes in buildings, or it can be used. There are you probably are aware that there are uh, laser weaponry that you can use to take out IC, like missiles and so on, right? So you can have a la like a laser sitting on a satellite that can be used to take out uh, ICBM or something of that sort. I thought that was only 007 stuff. Um, yeah, some 007 stuff is a little ahead of, of the technology curve, but... They've caught up but, now? Yeah, but now there are, there are laser weapons that are powerful enough to take out missiles. Right. Now, are they actually installed in space? I don't know. Somebody who's more into the military could probably answer that question. Right? Or but not answer. Or not answer. It. Or kill me as soon as they answer the question. Right? They do have some installed. Okay, there's your answer. They do have some installed, but they've never been able to get them to work properly as in hit and miss on the flight. Okay. Yeah. So that then is the current status. Extra credit for speaking up. Right? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so this is how, this is an example of a solid state, this is not a, yes, it is a solid state laser. There are different kinds, I mean, I used to work with a, like a gas operator, like a CO, carbon dioxide. So you can have a laser that's based on gases. In principle, I suppose you could have a laser that's based on liquids, never seen one, and then solid state, where everything inside it is solid, right? So this is not a solid state laser. I take back what I said, right? <laughs> it's not a solid state laser. <laughs> this is actually, it's got gases in it, so it's not solid state. Okay, I've worked with solid state lasers, so anyway. So, in a laser, like a lab laser, it's not uncommon. Here you can get one of these lasers that shoots out a red beam, right? So it's, you can see this red light and bouncing out the mirror, bouncing out the mirror and heading off. So, it's inside this thing, this laser, what happens is, there is a tube that has two gases in it, helium and neon. So the helium are the little black dots, the neon are the big red dots. What happens is, you can apply a bias, a voltage, and have electrons that come and hit the helium atoms to create excited helium atoms. So that's the circle. So this is the unexcited, this is the excited helium atom. Now what happens is the excited helium atom then goes and interacts, it bounces, if you will, off of a neon atom, minding its own business, neon atom gets excited. It's like all of a sudden if you were to go and jab your neighbor, right? And so you get excited, I give you candy or chocolate, you get excited and you jab the neighbor and she says, what's up with that? Right? Or something of that sort, right? So you're the helium, you get excited, you then go and bounce into the neon neighbor and get the neon neighbor excited. Now what happens is, the neon neighbor that's excited jumps down, the electron of the neon jumps down and gives off a photon which will go off in different directions. The photon emission is typically random. It can go off in different directions, right? So that's why these lines are heading off in different directions. Now some of these lines, by, by random chance if you will, are traveling parallel to the length of this laser. So they travel along these lines, and what happens is the photon at the end comes to a mirror, right? And the photon bounces back. So it bounces back and travels here, bounces off a mirror, b travels back. So it travels back and forth. Now an unusual property of these photons slash the system is that a photon that is whizzing by, say, let's say there's a photon that's traveling here, it comes and bumps into you. And what happens is you give off your excited energy. So now we've got two atoms, two photons, right? Say, let's say the photons miss you, but then they bump into you. And you, right, you decay, you de-excite, and you give off another photon. So one photon became two, then became three, then hit, bumped into her, became four, hit the wall, came back, and basically is like stripping off the excitation of all these atoms as it goes by. And the thing is that if the photon is traveling in this direction and it influences her to de-excite, the photon that she emits is with the same direction, the same phase, and the same uh, frequency, right? So that's why what happens is you have what's called a cascade where the single photon that bounces off here creates a second and then back and forth and each time they go back and forth they get more and more of these photons to to come off from the atoms and what happens is once it's past a certain intensity the light is able to make it through this mirror because it turns out this mirror is not a hundred percent reflective mirror it's like a half mirror it's a semi reflective 
mirror, right? So then the light comes out at this end, and you end up seeing this blue, or rather this red beam, right? Coming off. So that's how this laser works. Now, laser, the acronym stands for Light Amplification by Stimulated Emission of Radiation. So, yeah, the need? A weird, as the case may be. So you're amplifying the light by stimulating emission of radiation. So the, the where the stimulation comes in is the fact that she's the, she's all excited, but she's just sitting here excited, she's sitting there excited, but minding her own business. Along comes a photon and like tickles her. She says, 